eight out of 10 K-State Gardner participants reported increasing their physical and or emotional health through the skills they gained in our webinars. 82% of Kansas Gardner participants harvested fresh fruits, vegetables, and herbs they grew with the help of our webinars. 90% of K-State Garden Hour participants reported they used unbiased and research-based information to solve plant and garden problems after participating in our webinar. Plant Heroes Wear Purple. Discover K-State Garden Hour at ksre-learn.com slash k-state garden hour and become your own garden superhero. Hello, everyone, and welcome to the 2022 K-State Garden Hour series. Wow, that was a cool video, wasn't it? If this is your first time joining us, welcome. If you're a regular, welcome back, and we're happy to have you joining us again. Since we started this webinar series back in 2020, we have reached over 30,000 garden enthusiasts just like you. Thank you for your continued support of this series. This webinar is hosted by K-State Research and Extension, my name is Kelsey Hattisall, and I'm the horticulture agent for the River Valley District, and I will be your host today. Everyone involved in the development of this series is an extension professional for K-State. Before we get started, we'd like to do a couple housekeeping notes to cover. Please use the Q&A feature for questions related to this presentation. We will be doing question and answer session at the end of the presentation if there's time, so please put all of your questions into the Q&A so they don't get lost in the chat. Our moderators today are Dennis Patton and Calla Edwards. They will be sharing information throughout the presentation as well as trying to answer some of your questions in the Q&A. This webinar will be recorded and will be posted to our K-State Garden Hour webpage. We typically upload additional resources related to each topic as well, so be sure to check there for more information on today's topic as well as previous topics, as well as a list of our upcoming topics for the 2022 series. Today's topic is new and improved annual flower varieties. Which varieties are going to provide you with an outstanding summer performance? Well, let's find out. I'm pleased to introduce our speaker today, Matthew McKernan. He is the horticulture agent in Sedgwick County. Please give us a few moments while we transition to his presentation. Thank you, thank you, Kelsey, and welcome everybody. Thrilled to have so many of you with us today. Um, and especially excited to get to talk about plants, especially on a, a rainy day like today out here in Wichita right now. We're getting a pretty heavy downpour on the west side of town. And uh, so it's good to see the rain, but excited to talk flowers in the outdoors. So let's go ahead and get started. My name is Matthew McKernan, and I'm the horticulture agent for K-State Research and Extension here in Sedgwick County. Um, a few of you may recognize the photos here. This is of Botanica, or Wichita Gardens here in, in the Wichita, Kansas area. Um, that was my backyard growing up. My dad is the landscape supervisor out there, and so growing up, all my life, I was surrounded by annual flowers. So at an early age, had a great appreciation and love of annual flowers and all the beauty that they bring into the landscape. As I started with K-State Research and Extension after graduating from the horticulture program at K-State, I was introduced to the Prairie Star Trials up at the Olathe Horticulture Research Station. And let me tell you, that just drove my appreciation and love of uh, annual flowers even further. And so I wanna be able to take a few of the things that I've learned through the years and some of the ongoing research that we're continuing to try to do even without the, the Prairie Star Trials so that we can help you be more successful and have greater beauty in your landscape with the annual flowers that you try to grow. Um, from the poll today, it looks like a lot of you are, are pretty confident flower experts, and so hopefully there's still some new things that you'll be excited to learn today. And hopefully all of you, whether you're growing those annuals in the ground or the containers, hanging baskets, raised beds, whatever your case is, hopefully you'll have some great takeaways that you can use from today's presentation. So let's go ahead and get started. Uh, let's get to the plants because I know that's what you're really here for today. Um, so as our, our kind of plan for today, what we're gonna talk about first is plant life cycles and just cover a few of the basics before we get into, into deep with the plants just so that we're all on the same page starting out. Then we'll jump into selecting some of those new and improved annual flower varieties that you wanna learn about. 
And then we'll close up today talking about how to successfully care for those annual flowers and end with some Q&A time. But anytime you have questions, please feel free to use the Q&A box today. And our great team of horticulture agents will help you answer some of those questions as we go through. Um, but I got to warn you right off the bat, there's like a lot of plants in this presentation. So hold on as we get started today. Um, so like I said, we want to start today with just a few basics about plant life cycles. Um, and I really want to define a couple of terms because even as seasoned gardeners, sometimes we can get these terms confused. Typically, we have three types of life cycles that our plants can have. We can have perennial plants, biennial plants, or annual plants. And let's define each of those quickly before we get started today. Perennials, those are really going to be our plants that grow for more than one growing season. Um, usually with our perennial plants, they're going to die down to the ground in the winter, but the roots are still alive on the plant. Those plants are going to then produce new leaves next year, followed by flowers. And usually these plants live at least two years, but usually most of our perennials, in a, in a standard sense, we talk about them surviving at least three years in the landscape, hopefully. The next group of plants is our biennial plants, and those are plants with a two-year life cycle. Um, we don't have too many of those biennial plants, but things like hollyhocks, foxgloves, and a lot of our vegetable plants, for example, can be biennials. And with a biennial plant, typically we have leaves that are grown on the plant the first year, and we go through the winter or the dormant season, and then the second year those plants come out with new leaves and then produce flowers and seeds. Um, so a lot of our vegetable plants like carrots, turnips, parsley, we, we consume those and pull them out of the garden before they ever get to that second year. Um, but there are some of our plants that are considered biennials. But most importantly today, what we're really trying to focus on are what we call our annual flowers. And annuals are basically any plant that complete its entire life cycle from leaves to flowering to seed production all within one growing season. Um, with the three different types of plants, the way I keep it straight is your annual flowers must be planted annually. Um, so that's, that's kind of my trick for you today when we're talking about trying to remember the difference between the three types of plants. For most of our annuals, usually it's the frost or the freeze that's going to signal the end of that plant's lifespan. And especially that's the case for our summer annuals that we'll be talking about today. Uh, the tricky thing with an annual is it's sometimes an annual depending on where you live. For example, I love lantana. So you'll see quite a few of those today in our presentations. But down in Texas, Florida, some of our southern climates where they don't get as cold in the winter, some of those lantanas can actually be a perennial plant because the winter isn't cold enough to kill them. So they come back year after year. So I know we've got people from all over the United States joining us today. And so keep in mind that what's an annual here in Kansas may be a perennial for where you live today. So why annuals? Why are we going to spend an hour talking about annuals and trying to grow them in the landscape? And there's a few dis discouraging things that we have to deal with when we deal with annual flowers. The reality is they're a lot of work. We have to replant them every year because they're going to die off in our winters or whatever their dormant season is. They usually require a lot of water and fertilization to really get the most out of those plants. Annuals, they can be a little bit expensive to purchase. And if we have really cool, wet springs, sometimes that delays or stunts those annuals until the right growing season um, comes along. But despite all of those things, we love annual flowers because of the flower power they bring to the landscape. There are gonna be very few other plants out there that are gonna bring the type of color and flowering through an extended period of your growing season like our annual flowers do. The annual flowers are gonna be bright and showy. And like I said, typically bloom for long seasons at a time. You usually with annuals have a wide variety of colors, shapes, and sizes. And with that opportunity to replant every year, you also then have the opportunity each year to try new flowers and renew your interest in the landscape and, and change up those seasonal colors. Um, generally, annuals are pretty easy to grow, especially if you pick the right annuals. And that's what we're gonna focus on the majority of our presentation today. But the reality is successful landscape designs typically include not only our annual plants, but our perennials, our trees, our shrubs, um, all of those combined in a successful landscape. So even though we're focusing really on the annuals today, um, there's a lot of other great resources out there to help you pick some of those other perennials uh, to provide some winter interest and in seasonal structure in your landscape. So let's get started with selecting annual flowers. 
I don't know about you, but this is how I feel like Kansas has to be. With our Kansas summers every single year, we've got at least some period of Kansas that is, or our Kansas summers that are really hot and really dry. Um, the whole summer may not be like that. We've been lucky the last few summers, but there's always that stretch that's super hot and dry. And so I feel like this when we walk outside and have to deal with that heat. And unfortunately, our plants sometimes do too. They just melt or can't take those environmental extremes that um, the heat and the drought bring for Kansas. So selecting the right annual plant is very important. But it's not only the heat and the drought that can cause problems. We also have to deal with other environmental extremes like our wind. So we put our annual flowers through a lot when we put them out in the landscape. So we really wanna focus on selecting the right annuals in the right place in order to deal with those environmental extremes. Uh, because as we all can relate to, I wish I could give you this as your souvenir for the day, your, your gift bag here. Um, but every day in Kansas is different when it comes to the weather extremes. And so we wanna be able to have plants that can handle all of those. So how do we get plants for Kansas that are gonna handle those extremes? Well, there's several different ways that we can go about that. Typically what we wanna to try to do is use our local resources and K-State Research and Extension is a great local resource. We've got specialists in horticulture across the state, but we also have agents in every county. And so with a lot of those different county offices, there's a lot of different plant trials that you can find across Kansas. In the past, we've had the Prairie Star Program and the Prairie Bloom Program, and I'll talk about those here in just a second. But currently, we also have lots of different demonstration gardens where you can go out during the summer months, the spring, the fall, and even the winter, and see some of those plants demonstrated for you. But I do want to spend a couple minutes talking about some of the past resources that we've had and resources that are still available today. Um, we have had in the past the Prairie Star Flower Program, which is really a annual flower trial that looked for the best of the best of our annual plants that are being introduced each year. When you go to the garden centers and nurseries each year, there are new varieties of annuals introduced to the market. Plant breeders are always trying to do bigger, better, healthier, stronger plants. And so we want to know which of those plants are going to grow and bloom well here in Kansas and really do so with minimal care. And this is the type of thing that we're exactly looking for in these plant trials, whether it was the annual flower trials through the Prairie Star Program or in our current demonstration gardens across Kansas. What we're really trying to do is look at when we give these plants an opportunity to grow under the same growing conditions, same types of sunlight, same types of water, which one of these are going to thrive and which one of these are going to struggle. And I think this is really fascinating here because when you look at these two plants, they're obviously very different in their ability to grow in Kansas. But genetically, they're very similar. The portulaca is what you're seeing here in these pictures. So both of these plants are portulaca and they're both in the cupcake series. So when you go to the garden center, you're gonna find the general type of plant, the series that that plant is in, and then the specific variety. And so here, really the only difference is the, the varieties. We have peachy on the right-hand side of your screen and grape jelly on the left-hand side of your screen. And I don't know about you, but if I was to go out not knowing any better and purchase this Portulaca Cupcake Series grape jelly variety, and I planted that in my landscape and it looked like this with poor growth, very few flowers, I would be thinking to myself, what did I do wrong? Why, is, why, why can't I get this plant to grow better? And the reality is this plant is maybe just not a great choice for Kansas. Whereas if we go out and purchase just a slightly different type of portulaca, maybe a little bit different color than the, the purpley flowers of the grape jelly variety, we could have tremendous differences in the performance that we get. Oftentimes we may have to pay a few cents to a few dollars more for some of these varieties that are better adapted to Kansas. But if your landscape has to look between one of these two, I think a few dollars extra spent is usually a good investment when it comes to selecting the right annual flower varieties. And so with our Prairie Star program, that's really what we looked at. We were, were trying to see what plants are gonna grow well in Kansas, what plants aren't gonna grow well in Kansas. And the reality is in a lot of our research and our demonstration gardens, a dead plant is not a bad plant because it tells us whether or not that plant is well suited for all of the extremes that they have to grow in in Kansas. So here's just a few pictures from the past of what these uh, Prairie Star Flower Trial programs look like. And so a lot of these 
are going to be plants that we recommend and are included in our publications of recommended Prairie Star annual flowers. So a lot of these plants that we are able to grow were actually grown and tested before they were available in garden centers and nurseries. So even though some of this research is a few years old, a lot of the varieties that you can find in our Prairie Star flowers and our Prairie Bloom flowers, um, those are still going to be available commercially. And so some of those recommendations you'll still see. The Prairie Bloom program really focuses on our perennial flowers and the Prairie Star program really focuses on the annual flowers. So both of those links will be in the chat for you if you wanna check out those publications. There's a lot of great plants recommended in those lists and you'll still be able to find some of them um, out when you're shopping at garden centers and nurseries. If you wanna see pictures from some of those trials, I'd encourage you to visit our website, kansasroots.org. A lot of those annual flower pictures were converted to this website. So when you look for marigolds or a lot of our different annual flowers, you'll be able to see pictures actually from our Prairie Star and Prairie Bloom flower trials on that website. And again, that link will be in the chat as well. But because those two programs have ended, we're really now focusing on what local extension offices are doing across the state of Kansas and their local demonstration gardens. Um, here in Sedgwick County, we have a wide variety of different demonstration gardens on our property. And what, one of the things we're really focusing on with one of those demonstration gardens is annual flowers. And so this is what our annual flower trial here in Sedgwick County looks like. It's these very large containers that are grown outside of our vegetable demonstration garden. They sit basically on the southwest side of the building. So they're, most of these are getting full sun throughout the heat of the summer. And honestly, this is a pretty tough place to grow. We've got a lot of reflected heat here off of the sidewalk. That asphalt reflects the heat. And so we're really looking for tough plants in these trial containers. Um, each of these pots, just as sort of a size reference for you, is about two feet tall and about two feet wide. Um, so as we look through the pots today, they're pretty big. Uh, you'll also notice that the they're really growing in a highly organic soil mix, basically a heavy compost mix, and so that's kind of refreshed every year as well. Here in our annual flower trials, we're really trying to grow these plants on minimal maintenance, so they're not deadheaded, they're not pruned. If they die, that's okay. We want to know that they're just maybe not well recommended for Kansas. And again, here's another example from our trials here in Sedgwick County. We're looking at two verbenia. Uh, both of them are a white flower. So again, just at first glance, you really don't know the difference between the two when you're shopping at the garden center or nursery. Um, the verbenia on the left here is in the Endurascape series. Again, white flower, just like the one on the right. The only difference here is the verbenia on the right is the Firehouse series. So basically same type of plant, just slightly different genetics. And here, just at first glance, there's not a ton of difference. The big thing you notice is a lot of the flowers in the firehouse white cover the entire plant. Whereas in the Endurascape series here, we've got a lot of dead space or, or just green space where flowers aren't covering. And so when you look at just a section of those plants, we're really going to prefer in this example, the Verbenia firehouse white, just because of the amount of flower coverage over those plants. And really time is telling with a lot of these annual flower trials because by the end of the summer, that Endurascape white couldn't survive the heat and basically completely tanked. And while the Verbenia firehouse white at the end of the summer here didn't have any flowers, but was still alive. Um, and so we're really trying to judge these flowers in our annual flower trial throughout the summer and throughout the growing season. Typically our annuals are planted in May and we are going to evaluate them monthly throughout the growing season till our first frost, typically around the October timeframe. With these plants, the two things we are looking for and judging our plants on is their overall vigor and their overall floriferousness or basically flower power. So I wanna have you see some of the plants that have done extremely well in our trials this past year. We're gonna kind of show you the top 10 and uh, really show you what some of these things that we're looking for in the flower trials that we're doing here. So. Hold on, you're gonna see a lot of plants, but hopefully you're excited for some nice plant pictures here. So our first plant that we're gonna look at from our 2021 trials, and really our overall performer was a lantana. This is in the Shamrock series and it's a variety called peach. 
And this is a prime example of what we're trying to look for in high quality annual flowers in the trials that we're doing. Uh, again, this is a, an annual variety that we trialed last year. So we planted it in May and this is a picture from October and you can see down at the bottom um, the date the photo was taken. And what we're looking for here is what's the overall vigor, how healthy is the plant and what's the overall floriferousness or the flower power that that plant has. You can see in the picture, there's a lot of deep dark green foliage. Uh, the plant is very dense. It's not laggy or blowing around in the wind and looking ugly. So vigor is very high on this plant. In regards to floriferousness or that flower power, we see tons of flowers across the plant. Uh, so ideally, this is the, the type of plant that we're looking for in our annual flower trials. Lantana, like I mentioned earlier, are one of my favorite annual flowers. I love Lantana primarily because they're so heat and drought tolerant. The hotter it is, the happier Lantana seem to be. Uh, not only that though, pollinators love them as well. And they're typically covered in a wide variety of flowers and there's quite a few different colors to choose from. The shamrock pink, or excuse me, the shamrock peach lantana here uh, is kind of more your medium sized lantana. It's not gonna be dwarf, but it's not gonna take over the whole bed. They're typically very mounding and dense here. Um, so it's gonna give you kind of a gumdrop shape in the landscape. The flower color is sort of this multicolored flower that changes as the flower ages, but a lot of pinks, oranges, and yellows you're going to find in the Lantana Shamrock Peach. Um, one more thing that I'll add as we talk about the flower trials here, in each of these pots, typically we're planting between three to five plants in each pot, and uh, it kind of varies from year to year on what we're given by different plant breeders, but usually in each one of these pots, we're looking at about three to five plants that have grown together. As far as the maintenance, they're watered three times a week. They have emitters in them that are gonna give them a gallon, of out, a gallon of water per hour. And like I said, we're usually watering about three times a week. So very minimal maintenance, no, no pruning, primping, or cleaning of the plant. What you see is what you get on how the plant is performing. So like I said, was very impressed with the Lantana Shamrock Peach from last year. And so that was probably our overall trial winner from the, the data that we collected. Number two on the list is Impatience Beacon Rose. A lot of people have backed off of Impatience in past years because of a disease called Impatience Downy Mildew. And this is a variety that has been bred to have a high resistance to Impatience Downy Mildew disease. And so it's not completely exempt from being attacked by the disease. But compared to a lot of the impatients out there, this is going to be far more disease resistance. The other great thing about this plant is you can see about a foot to a foot and a half tall and hot pink flowers. The, the brighter and more colorful the flowers are, I think the greater impact our annual flowers show in the landscape. Impatients are going to be a flower that we're going to really want to put in some partial to full shade. Um, so unlike the lantana that's going to prefer full sun, the impatience are definitely gonna need a little bit more protection in the landscape. You can see up close here, the, uh, the flower color, really just a hot pink flower, and really what you would expect from a traditional impatient, but just with a lot more disease resistance. Number three on our list is Callilophus, ladybird lemonade. Callilophus was a plant that was brand new to me last year, and I fell in love. Um, Callilophus is basically the genus of Texas primrose. Um, for those of you that are familiar with it, Texas primrose is a perennial wildflower, essentially. But what plant breeders have done is they've taken this plant and they've bred it to become an annual. And by doing that, what they're trying to accomplish is to get the plant to put on far more growth and far more flowers within one year. As a result, these plants typically are not going to survive the winter, but are going to have a great impact over the, the summer growing season that you would plant it. I love the Callilophus ladybird lemonade for several reasons. As you can see here, it filled in the pot great. This is gonna be a lower growing plant, more spreading than it is tall. Um, so typically you're gonna get six to 12 inches tall at the most, and they're gonna spread at least a foot to two foot wide. Uh, Callilophus ladybird lemonade was great because of the flower color. Um, you can see thorough, thorough flowering across the whole plant by the end of the summer. And these flowers are just gorgeous. The ladybird lemonade is more of a soft yellow color, but what I love about this variety is the two-toneness that you get. 
as the buds emerge and open, they kind of have a pink blush to a hot pink color. And that fades as the flower opens and matures basically into this yellow. Um, and then as that flower finishes its life cycle, it may take back a little bit of the pink color, but you're getting multiple tones of color all out of these one single flowers, which I think is really cool. Number four on the list from last year, ornamental sweet potato vine. This one is called Sweet Caroline series, and this is Red Hawk. As you can see, the growth here is, is pretty vigorous. We're talking about three to four feet in length, so needs its space in a hanging basket pot or in the landscape. Um, but what's neat about it is these five fingered leaves. You typically get new growth that comes out on the plant with kind of a, a lime green color, fades a little bit to more of an orangey purple. And then as the leaves kind of reach their mature size, they're more of that vibrant purple. So overall, you kind of get patches of multicoloredness throughout the plant, um, but really kind of purple in appearance overall. Great grower, and like I said, one that we would recommend from our research last year. Number five on the list, another lantana. This is called Lucky Pink. You can see here with this lantana, obviously much bigger in size than the first one we looked at. Um, this is typically going to be at least a three foot tall, two to three foot wide plant and really is going to need more space in the landscape. I think that's great because personally, the less lantana I have to buy to fill my flower beds, the better. Um, but this is going to be a plant that really is going to prefer its space if you're planting it in the ground or planting it out along the sidewalk in your flower beds, those types of places. With a lucky pink, you're really going to get more of a hot pink color. Um, you do still see some of those yellow center flowers in the lantana. Um, so you do sort of have bicolor or tricolored flowers, but really overall a much more pink appearance plant. Number six on the list is Evolvulus. Some of you may be familiar with the Blue My Mind series um, because it's been around for quite a few years. The newest Blue My Mind variety is XL. And basically with Evolvulus Blue My Mind XL, what we're seeing with this plant is a, a more aggressive growth pattern. So the plant gets a little bit bigger than the traditional Blue My Mind. And so the intent here that plant breeders are trying to accomplish is this is gonna compete a little bit better in a mixed container, for example, if you're doing a container or hanging basket, um, because the plant is gonna be a little bit more vigorous. There may be a few less flowers on the XL because so much energy is going into the, the growth of the plant, uh, but you still get those beautiful blue flowers. And I think Evolvulus is a great option for the landscape because a lot of our annual flowers don't offer that blue color. And so a lot of people like to see blues in the landscape. And so the Evolvulus is a great option. Uh, Evolvulus is also very heat and drought tolerant. And so it will be a great choice for those drier conditions as well. Number seven on the list, Vinca. This one is Vinca Mediterranean XP Dark Red. A lot of our traditional Vinca have been around for decades, but the Mediterranean XP series, this is a weeping series. So you're actually gonna get Vinca that trail down or spread across the ground as a ground cover rather than your typical upright bushy Vinca. Um, so you can see here easily within a growing season went up over the pot and down the side. So again, talking two to three feet in length of the trailing growth of this vinca. All vinca are really going to be pretty heat and drought tolerant. And so this Mediterranean XP dark red is going to be right up there with drought tolerance and heat tolerance. The one thing I will warn you with Vinca is they don't like a cold start to the summer. So it's always going to be better if we've got a cool wet summer or cool wet spring to maybe hold off planting your Vinca until the weather warms up just a little bit and dries out a little bit. Otherwise, you could really stunt the growth of your Vinca as you plant it. With the Mediterranean XP Dark Red, to me, the color is more of a hot pink to hot magenta rather than red. So don't let the name fool you. Um, but like I said, as you can see in the picture, a little bit more of that, that pink color than red. Number eight on the list is another Calilophus, Texas Primrose. This one is called Ladybird Sunglow. Um, as you can see here, this one had a tough go of it. 
Um, so probably is why it ranked a little bit lower on the list because the lantana next to it and the sunflower next to it, they were huge. So they shaded out the plant a little bit, um, but this is still in the top 10 because of its great performance. What you're going to see with the ladybird sun glow calliolophus is the flower color is a lot brighter, deeper, richer color. So you almost have more of a lemony yellow color rather than a, a washed out yellow color. The other great thing about calliolophus is I love the foliage on these plants. You have these real thin, narrow leaves. And to me, this adds a lot of texture in the landscape, even if the plant is not in bloom. Um, as you can see here, though, the hotter and drier it was, the more this plant bloomed. So the flowering was not a problem, but I think the, the foliage adds a lot as far as texture as well. Um, the difference here between the other Calliolophus, the ladybird lemonade that we looked at earlier, the big thing is going to be flower color and not seeing the two-toneness of the flowers as they open. Um, so just as a side-by-side -side comparison, the ladybird sunglow that we were just looking at right now um, has a much deeper, richer, more yellow color, where the ladybird lemonade that we looked at at the beginning of the list is a much more pale yellow color and has more of that pink coloration as the bud opens and the flower emerges. Still both great options though, um, if you can find them in the garden centers or nurseries this year. Number nine on the list is Angelonia Archangel Purple Improved. Um, as you can see here, Angelonia, again, heat and drought tolerance. You'll, you'll see that in most of the plants that we're talking about today. This is gonna be a very upright plant, typically around the two foot height or so. And as that plant grows upright, it basically produces these spikes of flowers that go up the plant. With the Archangel Purple improved, what we are looking at here from plant breeders is an attempt to get the Angelonia to, to bloom a little bit earlier than some of the other varieties out there. Um, the color on this is a very deep, rich purple, um, which is a very nice addition. And like I said, heat, drought, humidity, these plants will do excellent in those types of situations. The last one on our top 10 list, this is going to be Lantana again, and this is Luscious Citron. This Lantana is going to be much more spreading and sprawling than the other two Lantana that we looked at. You can see from just the picture here, the plants have overgrown their pot and are growing into the plants next to them. Um, so on these, you're definitely looking at probably a spread in the range of three foot, plus or minus a foot, depending on how well they grow for you. Um, so they're a little less compact, a little less dense, but still covered in flowers. The luscious citron is more, again, of that pale yellow color, um, but does have some nice deep yellow color in the center of those flowers as well. Just like all the lantana we've talked about, heat tolerance, drought tolerance, and a pollinator magnet. So lots of benefits to our lantanas. I can't stop at 10 though. I also want to look at a few of the honorable mentions that we had from last year as well. I know I've got some coleus lovers on the Zoom call today, so I want to make sure that we highlight a few of those as well. Uh, one of the new coleus that we tried last year was Col coleus vulcan. And this is going to be basically a red-leafed coleus, and it has kind of a bright yellow margin or edge around the leaf. One of the things that we're looking at when we're rating the coleus is how many flowers does that coleus produce? The flowers, some people love them, some people hate them, but really most plant breeders are looking to not have a lot of coleus flowers because oftentimes they detract from the overall visual appearance of the leaf, which is really what a lot of our coleus are grown for. So as you can see here, there's quite a few flower spikes, but not so much that it blocks you being able to see the leaf color on this coleus vulcan. Um, so here's an up close picture of the leaves. Um, beautiful red, kind of almost deep burgundy as it emerges with that bright yellow leaf. This is going to be a plant that's tolerant of both shade and sun. And uh, so the more shade it gets, the more lime green and burgundy it is, the more sun it gets, the more red and yellow those leaves are gonna be. Another honorable mention was our Vinca Cora Cascade Cherry. This is again, another trailing Vinca. So great for containers, hanging baskets, still has that heat and drought tolerance. And again, is more of a hot pink color. Um, your typical vinca flower here, kind of the five-petaled flower. 
Um, typical size, but again, great for hanging baskets, containers, or as a ground cover in the landscape. Sort of an unusual one we had the opportunity to trial last year was a basil plant, and this is a new variety called Pesto Besto. Um, don't know who gets to name these plants, but I love it. Um, as you can see here, the plant is massive. This is actually going to be a sweet Italian basil grown from seed. And uh, one of these attributes that plant breeders have developed with this pesto besto is its resistance to downy mildew. Um, so more of a problem from some, for some areas more so than others, but this one has been bred for some more downy, downy mildew resistance. Um, like your typical basil has great aromatic leaves. I just love to be around this plant in the trial because even if you just brushed up against it, you got that lovely aromatic basil smell. Um, as you can see in these pictures, very large, very vigorous, two to three feet in height. And uh, with such a big size, if you're harvesting this plant as an herb, there's going to be lots and lots of leaves to choose from in order to supply you with all the, the pesto or Italian cooking that you're going to be doing with it. Another plant that was on our honorable mention list from last year is this Angelonia Angel Face Steel Blue. We've had this one in the trial for a couple years now, and every year it's a solid performer. Um, as you can see here, very upright growth. These spikes of flowers basically grow straight, straight up and down, typically two to three feet in overall height. And one of the big things with the Angel Face series and the Steel Blue variety is the really large flower size. This is gonna be one of the largest Angelonia flowers that you're gonna find. Uh, probably nickel to quarter size diameter flowers uh, that run up and down this stalk. So this one's great because the larger flowers mean you can appreciate that color and that beauty from a little bit further away than some of our smaller flowering angelonia. Another addition to our flower trial last year is heliotrope. And this is a variety called Augusta lavender. Uh, again, this one here was planted in the ground rather than in the container. We had a few extra, so we stuck it in the ground. There's no irrigation here, no nothing, and this thing thrived on the neglect that we gave it. Um, so if it can do that well on such little care, I think it's worth mentioning in our honorable mention list here. Um, pollinators loved this plant. Uh, you kind of have this purple plant with a yellow center or excuse me, a purple flower with a yellow center. So you do get a little bit of multi-toned color. Bees, butterflies, wasps, all your pollinators were all over this plant during the summer. Um, the thing to note with heliotrope is the plant is toxic if ingested. So if you have problems with people eating your plants or pets eating your plants, heliotrope may not be the, uh, the plant for you. But if you're trying to do something in the back of the landscape for pollinators, uh, this is a great plant for that. Our last honorable mention that we're going to look at today from our 2021 trial was our sweet alyssum or lobularia. This is a variety called Violet Night. And uh, again, tons of little purple flowers. This is really going to be a lot better fall color. So a lot of people get a lot of color early on in the season. Um, it doesn't do a whole lot in June and July. As you can see, this is what the plant looked like early on. By August, it had some flowers, but really the end of the season towards the fall is really when this plant was loaded with, with plant flowers. And uh, again, pollinators love this one. So hope you were okay with all those plants. Uh, we went through them fast, probably should have went through them faster, so I stay on time here today. Um, but Hope you're ready for a few more plants because there is no such thing as too many plants. So I wanna cover just a few more today here as well. And these are just ones that we've grown over the past year. Not gonna spend much time on them. We've provided a handout that's in the chat or available on our website of these other ones. So we'll go through them very quickly, but just to flash just some beautiful plants that we've seen um, in our flower trials the last few years. Another sweet potato vine here, this is called Medusa Green. It's in the Sweet Caroline series. This is going to be one of the most highly fingered uh, sweet potato plants, meaning it has the most number of lobes of any sweet potato. Um, so what plant breeders are going for here is really a tropical look to it, and it's going to be a little bit less aggressive than some of the other sweet potatoes out there. So still going to get two to three feet, 
um, but is probably going to share a container or hanging basket maybe a little bit better uh, with other annuals that you might want to mix into it. Again, for my coleus lovers out there, the Color Blaze series has a lot of great options, as well as Main Street series. But the Color Blaze series that we've tried here for a couple years is Wicked Witch. Love the name, uh, but again, great flower leaf color here, not a lot of flowers. And depending on whether it's in the full sun or full shade, you'll get slightly different color intensities out of the leaves. If you're looking for something upright in the landscape, the Canna Canova series is a great option. Typically these cannas are gonna be three to four feet in height, maybe a little bit shorter if you keep it on the drier side, but the rose here, uh, variety, tons of beautiful flowers, love the clean color. If you have problems with Japanese beetles in your area, this may not be a great choice because the Japanese beetles love it just as much as I do, um, but can be a great choice. Over the past few years, we've trialed some Mexican petunia. This is a macho morado. Um, again, not something that's gonna bloom really a lot during June and July. This is more of a fall blooming plant. So don't give up on it too early because by the fall, it's covered with these uh, beautiful blue flowers. If you're looking for more shade plants, the begonias now have a double up series and it's a, it's a dwarf begonia series. So this one's double up pink. You get these clusters of small little flowers. Um, typically those clusters are gonna be two to three inches in diameter. You can kind of see my camera lens here in comparison, um, but you'll get lots of clusters of flowers that just cover the plant. So double up pink is gonna be a pink flowering variety with a green leaf. There's also double up white, which is a white flowering variety with a chocolate leaf. Um, there's also a, a double up red out there as well. Another begonia, this one's a little bit bigger, is the Top Hat series, and it's called Rose Bicolor. Again, probably in the two foot or so height range, um, but this one has a beautiful bicolored flower, so you get that pink and white, kind of with the yellow flower color in the middle. If you really want to try some sweet alyssum or lobularia, I would really recommend Moonlight Night. This is one that we grew last year. And it flowered much more consistently throughout the entire summer, even throughout the heat. Um, and so again, great plant for pollinators and one that I was impressed on how well it bloomed throughout the growing season. Because you can never have enough lantana. This one is luscious red zone, uh, really deep, rich red color. So if you're looking for vibrant reds in the landscape that again are heat and drought tolerant, this is a great choice for that. Just like I mentioned before, pollinators love them and the color is fantastic. These aren't touched up or altered at all. That's exactly what the flowers look like. There's a couple new Celosia varieties out there. These are the Soul series. This one's Gecko Green. And what we're plant breeders have done with the Celosia in these cases is they're growing them for the leaves rather than the flowers. So you get these very interesting multicolored leaves, kind of like you would grow for a coleus, uh, but in a completely different type of plant. There's also the Soul Series Lizard Leaf here, which is more of a red leaf. Um, as you can see, there are still some flowers by the end of the summer, but they're not nearly as prolific as the typical Celosia would be. And that's okay because they're intended more to be grown for the leaf color rather than the flowers. So you can see here, midsummer, lots of leaf color and a few flowers by the end of summer. Gallardia, this one is an annual Gallardia flower. Um, so it's only going to grow one year, but you can see these plants were loaded with flowers. This heated up series is great. There's two colors, the scarlet here, which is your typical Gallardia color, uh, bloomed its heart out all summer long. So you can see not only the seed heads of the past flowers, but all the flowers that are through it. Again, we grew this one in the ground with no irrigation and it just blanketed the ground. Uh, not very tall, more spreading, but a great choice. Another Gallardia in the heated up series is just this solid yellow. So if you're looking for a different color than red, they've also got a yellow one that performed very well as well. We've got ornamental sweet potato vine. This is the solar tower series. And so these are gonna be a vertical sweet potato uh, growing straight up and down. And there's the lime green as well as what they call solar tower black, which is more of a purple leaf. Again, in the color blaze series, we've got the coleus golden dreams. Again, depending on whether you're growing it in full sun or in shaded areas, you'll get slightly different leaf color, but again, very adaptable to different parts of the landscape. 
On the Vinca here, this is Mega Bloom Orchid Halo. This is going to be one of the largest Vinca flowers that you're going to see. This is more of the upright plant, the more traditional shape, but these flowers are going to be two to three inches across in length, so huge flowers. On the opposite of that end of Vinca, we also tried Vinca Soiree with great success. This is going to be Kauai Pink, so very tiny flowers, um, but even though the flowers are tinier, you can expect a lot more of them and uh, really going to provide some great color. Last one I'll throw out here from the past. Again, a plant I wasn't familiar with but was impressed with after the, the trial was Isotoma. And this is star flower. It's a variety called Patty's Pink. Love the small delicate flowers, but even more, I love the leaf texture that it brings to the landscape. So take a breath. That was a lot of plants. Hopefully you can refer back to your handouts for the names of some of those that you liked. Um, and that'll be on our website if you wanna review these later. Wanna to close today though with some tips for being successful with the annual flowers that you plant. Uh, because we want those plants to be as big and strong and healthy as we can. And so we wanna be there to support them along their journey here. One of the big things with annual flowers is we wanna make sure bed preparation is taken care of. Really, it's gonna be best if we can prepare our beds in the fall and really try to add organic matter. Compost can do wonders for increasing the growth and overall performance of your plants and the quality of your soil. Never ever do we wanna add sand because clay soils in Kansas and sand, combining those together make concrete and that's not a recipe for success. We also encourage you to soil test regularly, especially in our annual flower beds about every three years or so to make sure you've got the nutrients you need for those plants to be successful. Not only is it about picking the right plant, it's also about picking the right location for the plant. And so when you're selecting your annuals, you really wanna focus on sunlight needs. There's typically four types of sun exposure that you're gonna see on the plant labels as you walk around the garden centers and nurseries. If you see something that says full sun, typically what that means is it needs six or more hours of sunlight over the course of the day. Part sun is gonna be areas that need four to six hours of sun. If it's listed as part shade, typically that area is gonna receive less than four hours of sunlight. And if it's full shade, those areas are intended for no direct sunlight. And this is important to distinguish because not all shade is the same. A shady place under a tree is gonna be much different than a shady place underneath a building or overhang. Usually with our annual flowers, the more sun we provide them, the more flowers we're going to get. Uh, but that's just sort of a, a rule of thumb. When you're out purchasing these annuals, you really want to look for plants that are short, compact, well branched, and I would encourage you to look for the plants without flowers or buds. And the reason for this is we want to get those plants established and really have them establish their roots before they spend a lot of energy creating the flowers and the beauty. So it won't hurt if you go ahead and clip off flowers at, after you get them purchased from the garden center and nursery before you plant them. Um, but the biggest thing with purchasing annuals is always look for those proven cultivars and varieties that we know are gonna do well in our area. We also wanna pay attention to when we plant those varieties. Uh, I like this, I'm not going outside until the temperature is above my age. I can relate, Snoopy. Um, when we get our plants home for the first time, especially if you're one of those eager gardeners who wants to get your annuals out in the early spring and enjoy them as long as possible, we want to make sure that we harden our plants off. And basically what that means is we want to expose them to the growing conditions outdoors during the day and maybe give them a little bit more protection inside at night because the growing conditions inside a greenhouse are going to be very different than the extremes of the weather outside in the landscape. So a lot of our garden centers and nurseries will harden off plants for you, kind of slowly exposing them to the weather of Kansas. Um, but if you're getting plants right out of the greenhouse, you may wanna do this for a few days to just acclimate your plants to more light and cooler temperatures than they were receiving inside. The other big thing about planting is we wanna make sure that we wait until frosts or freezes passed. Usually that's around April 16th in Kansas, but every year is different and every part of the state is different. Um, at, at planting, we also want to make sure that we tease apart the roots that are in the pots. We want to try to help those roots grow out into the soil as quickly as possible. 
and I know we all can relate to this in Kansas where early March, late February, it feels like spring, but we always have that one last hit of winter that comes along. And so with that, we really wanna look at our local forecasts to see when we're in the clear from frost and freezes. Usually around April 10th is when we say we're at a 50-50 chance based on historical last freezes of no longer having a freeze or frost. Usually by April 21st, we're past 90% of our uh, historical freezes and frosts. And usually by the beginning of May now, you're usually in great shape to go ahead and plant. Don't forget to mulch your annuals when you're done planting. Helps them have them, it helps them regulate their moisture uh, in the soil, and it's also going to help control weeds. We don't want too much mulch. That can be a bad thing, but ideally that two to three inch layer of mulch is going to be helpful. Annual flowers are typically going to need a little bit more water than some of our landscape plants. Uh, so usually plan to give them at least an average of one inch of water per week. If you don't know how much that is with your rain, your irrigation system, set out a can and measure it. Um, usually when we water, we really want to try to apply lots of water at once that's going to really thoroughly wet the soil several inches deep. And then we allow several days before we water again for that soil to drain out to really encourage deep, healthy roots. Uh, drip tubes and soaker hoses work well because they deliver that water to the ground without splashing up against the leaves, which may favor some of your diseases. Uh, the, the more sun and the more wind your annual flowers receive, the more water they're going to require. Um, so one of the ways that we can help with this is not only by watering more frequently, but by pulling containers closer together. This is going to help reduce their overall water loss and provide them some shade and wind protection from by using one another basically as a shade and wind block. And especially when we're watering containers, make sure you water until the containers start to drain water from the bottom of the pot. Um, once you started to see that, you know that container is thoroughly watered and you can move on to the next one. Last thing we'll talk about here is fertilization. More fertilization really does a big impact on producing healthier annuals. Most annuals bloom on new growth. And so providing some nitrogen is going to help us usually get some more annual flowers produced on on our plants. Um, typically with fertilizers, we've got two options. You can either do a slow release fertilizer that you would mix into the soil at planting, or there are water soluble fertilizers as well. Ideally, if you can find a fertilizer with a three, one, two ratio, that's gonna be ideal. All of our fertilizers typically have three numbers on the bag here, um, whether that's the front, top, front back, top, or middle. Um, and so usually we wanna see those numbers in a three, one, two ratio, something like a 15, five, 10. Um, ideally, if that first number, that's the percent of nitrogen, ideally, if that first number is between eight and 20%, that's gonna be what research shows is going to help us produce the most blooms on our annual flowers. So more flowers often means the happier, healthier plants. Um, you can fertilize as often as once a week, but don't overdo your fertilizer. Too much fertilizer can be a bad thing. So for most of us, we're going to fertilize once a month or bi-weekly with some of our liquid fertilizers. Um, make sure to pull weeds. Make sure to stake annuals if you've got really tall annuals in windy locations. Um, deadheading may help improve your overall flower performance, but most of our annuals are not going to be needed to be deadheaded because of the work that plant breeders are doing for them. And lastly, look for weeds, diseases, and insects. Really, I, my best advice for insect control on things like budworms is don't pick plants that are going to suffer from insects you know you have a problem with. And always follow and read the label instructions for any products that you would apply, whether that's fertilizers, insecticides, or disease prevention. So with that, I know we're out of time, but want to have a few minutes for questions today. So what do we got? All right, thanks, Matt. That was a great presentation. I can't wait to get to the garden centers here in a couple of weeks. Um, I'm going to turn it over to Dennis. I know we've had lots of action in the Q&A, so take it away, Dennis. Okay, I'm going to kind of prioritize these to more generic questions. There are a lot of questions about where to purchase them. So kind of let's yeah. start out with that. And then I got a few more production questions to follow that up. 
So I'd love to tell you I have a perfect solution on where to purchase them, but the reality is every garden center, every nursery um, is going to sell different plants. And so there's no one place that you can go, but typically your local garden centers and local nurseries will be your best option for finding some of these plants. The important thing when you're purchasing plants is to know which varieties to pick from so that when you go to the garden center and you see geranium, for example, you know which geraniums may do better um, rather than which ones are maybe cheapest or look the best at the time. Okay, so the next question is kind of a, a, a mixed question. So sure. a lot of people are wanting to get seeds and start seeds. So it might explain a little bit about how a lot of the annuals are produced now, vegetatively versus seed and, and those type of uh, questions. That, that's a great point. So a lot of annual flowers can be produced in two ways, either from seed or what's called vegetative cuttings, basically where you cut off a piece of plant, root it and grow an identical plant from that cutting. Most of these new annual flower varieties are vegetatively produced, meaning they have to be grown by cuttings because the seeds that these plants produce are unreliable and not the true, true to type variety that you see in these pictures. So oftentimes your annuals that you pay a little bit more for, those are gonna be vegetatively propagated because they know the genetics is the same from plant to plant to plant, and it doesn't have the variability of seed plants. So. Um, really most of these seeds or most of these annuals we looked at today, you're not going to be able to start from seed. They're going to have to be started from vegetative cuttings that you'll get that, that the, the nurseries and garden centers will do. Most of them are copyrighted or have patents on them. So you can't just go propagate them yourself. So keep that in mind and keep yourself out of trouble there too. That was going to be the follow-up question because people then started asking, well, how do I take cuttings? How do I save <laughs> these over? So you just might reiterate the patent process and, and that. Yep. Of course, there are no patent police out there looking for you either. Yep, most of these annuals are patented. And so the, the growers, the plant breeders have a patent to the genetic property rights of that plant. And so um, your garden centers or nurseries have specific approval to, to propagate those plants. Um, but again, you as a homeowner won't have the, the right to propagate most of these plants and especially not to sell them because of the patents that are on these plants, so. Yeah, and also I think the, the 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 cuttings, the starts that people buy, they come in huge quantities. So you just can't order six of this and six of that from some grower. They're ordering in thousands of these. Exactly. Uh, and then I think you also said this. So if they attempt to save seeds from these vegetative cuttings, there's no guarantee they're going to be viable or come back true to nature or true to plan. Exactly. With seeds, basically what happens mm -hmm. is you get cross pollination from different plants, and that brings in new genetics. And so seeds oftentimes are a lot more unreliable when they grow back because of having those different genetics from different parents. Okay, I'm going to switch gears on you a little bit. A um, couple questions came up about, are there any native annuals? Are there any native annuals? That is a great question. It was a good question. All I could think of was sunflowers. Yep, sunflowers can be an annual. I think Gallardia um, can be an annual. Coreopsis, there's some varieties of Coreopsis that are annuals. And again, basically what they're doing with these annual natives is they're taking a native plant and they're beefing it up to produce more flowers and more visual appearance in a shorter period of time. So I wouldn't expect them to be able to come back from year to year, um, but I might have had one of those Calliolophus come back. So I'm not sure if I identified it right in the landscape last week, but uh, sometimes they are able to overwinter, surprisingly enough. So if you had to pick two, three, four of these varieties for pollinators, for butterflies, hummingbirds, do you have kind of a, a top list that you've seen being more attracted to? Sure. For pollinator plants, gotta love the lantana. Pentas are another great plant. We trialed some of those, but I didn't talk about them today. We've got large flat flowers, so butterflies can easily land on those as well. Um, the lobularias, the sweet alyssums that we talked about, also love, loved by pollinators, especially some of our bees and smaller pollinators. Okay. Um, can you touch a little, I know I was answering so many questions, I didn't hear everything. Did you touch on a lot of questions on why you didn't have petunias or can you recommend a petunia? So you can yeah. kind of rewind on the budworm issue with uh, petunias and calabacoa. And sure. Geranium. So we've tried calabacoa and petunias and even some geraniums in our trials the past few years, but they suffer from an insect called a budworm, which is essentially an itsy bitsy caterpillar that eats out the flower before it blooms. And so you never get flowers on those plants. Control is really difficult of budworm and it involves a lot of insecticide sprays. So I don't consider those plants to be low maintenance. 
um, because you have to, to spray to keep them blooming oftentimes. So what we are really trying to focus on is alternative plants that are gonna grow well, flower well without having those insects problems. So there are a few petunias that we've had success with surprisingly, um, but a lot of these petunias just are, are gonna suffer here from budworms and, and not be worth the low okay. maintenance efforts that we're trying to accomplish. Okay. Uh, just real quick, uh, we have a lot of questions that come out on fertilization. So I think you covered at the end, correct? So yes. we're good to go. And repeat your watering schedule on your containers you use there in Wichita. Yeah, so our containers, we, they're two feet tall, so they have lots of soil space. We're really trying to soak them thoroughly when we water. So we water about three times a week. We let the water run for about two hours. So they're getting about two to four gallons of water. Um, that really soaks the soil and we give them a few days to dry out, not too far, but at least to dry down a little bit before we water again. And you don't put anything in the bottom of the containers except potting mix. No, yep, no rocks, no gravel, no nothing, correct? Nope. We've got them anchored to the ground, but there's nothing in there other than soil for the plants. Okay. Well, it's a minute till. So I think we've answered all the questions, all like 60 some of them. <laughs> so at least in the Q&A. So I'm going to turn it back over to the host and let them close out the garden hour. Thank you guys. All right. Thank you, Matt and Dennis. And Matt, that was a great presentation. And you had the record, I think, for questions so far this year. So once again, everybody, thank you for joining us for the K-State Garden Hour series hosted by K-State Research and Extension. We are so glad you were here today to learn about all the annual flower varieties that are out there. We have several interesting sessions coming up throughout the rest of our series. So join us next month on June 1st to learn about organic pest management for vegetable gardens. Once again, this session was recorded and will be posted on the website probably by tomorrow afternoon. If the webinar, after the webinar ends today, you will receive a prompt to take an evaluation survey. Please fill this out. We would greatly appreciate all and any of your feedback you're willing to give us. If you have any other questions, please don't hesitate to reach out to us by emailing us at thegardenhour at ksu.edu. Thank, again, thank you again for joining us. We do hope to continue to see you on the first Wednesdays of each month. Have a great rest of your week.